The last time this happened to me was in 1909, sorry, 2009, at the um, centenary meeting of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine with an audience of 1,500, and the speaker managed to get himself snowbound in Sheffield, um, leaving me um, less than 10 minutes uh, to prepare a lecture. Um, today, I've been very lucky. I've had 40 minutes. Um, it normally takes 40 hours to prepare a Gresham lecture, um, and I've um, managed to get that down to a very short time. Now, it has been a stroke of luck on my part. I don't know if any of you have seen these lovely little Oxford University Press books, a very short introduction to. Yes. Um, and good. Um, anyhow, um, I was persuaded last year to write one on parasitism. And I thought this is absolutely marvellous because I know a lot about parasites. And what I didn't know is they wanted me to include um, crops as well and fungi, something I knew very little about. And I thought I'd be very happy um, with my um, safety zone, my own comfort zone of parasites of humans. So I have learned a lot um, reading about And I'm going to um, transmit some of that to you today. And I've also got Chris's um, slides, and we'll whip through those. And I've had a quick look at those, and I think I do understand them. Now, um, some slides particularly I do understand very well. Now, um, for the non-biologists, I think it's very important um, to realise that the whole of the living world um, is divided into um, six different kingdoms. Um, these are the prokaryota, don't worry about the words. These are the bacteria, the animalia, we know about that, the plantae, the plants, fungi, um, and another strange group a protos uh, called the chromista, and they're a wonderful group of people who are interested in taxonomy and nothing else. And they've spent a lot of time um, wondering about this group. And then the protozoa, and that's another group that I've been very, very interested in. Now, um, I'm going to start off um, by trying to define what a parasite is, or what parasitism is. And um, it's a quite a difficult task, in fact, because no one really knows. Um, it was originally used by the ancient Greeks to... Um, in a derogatory way, to talk about those people who fed at the um, banquets of the rich. Um, these were called parasites, and the parasitos, the um, Greek word for that. Um, it's now used derogatory in many cases to apply to politicians um, and other <laughs> such people and bankers <coughs> and uh, people who run the utilities um, who live um, at us. But that's a good idea because they give you some idea of what a parasite is, of what parasitism is about. Now, um, Having got parasitism, it's one of a, a number of um, relationships that exist between two organisms, intimate relationships between two separate organisms. And um, these are um, the most important, the easiest one, in fact, to discuss first, um, is symbiosis. Now, symbiosis um, is a condition in which two organisms work together to their mutual advantage, and one of them can't exist without the other. Um, the best example of that is a lichen, um, because a lichen um, is a combination of an alga and a fungus. Um, the alga produces all the photosynthetic material, and the fungus just has the framework with it, with, within which this can actually work. This is a very good example of um, symbiosis. And there are many other examples. Um, for example, termites eat wood, which is rather foolish of them, because they have no enzymes that can digest wood. Um, so what they have to do is fill their guts with um, various organisms, protozoa and other organisms, um, and these digest the wood, and um, the termites then thrive. The um, sym symbionts can't uh, live without the uh, termite, and the termites can't live without the symbionts. Another example are the oxpeckers, and these um, feed on the ticks and lice on the outside of large mammals, um, and um, they pick off the ticks which is a tremendous advantage um, to the animal. It loses all these things feeding on its blood, and great advantage, of course, also um, to the um, oxpeckers, who then um, have a nice supply of blood, which is very, very nutritious. Now, um, the third area is called commensalism. Um, and um, you think I've only talked about that too, but in fact I mentioned parasitism earlier. Um, and um, commensalism is when two organisms live together. Um, and neither does any harm to the other, they just live communion together. And each of us um, is a host to tens of millions of different commensal bacteria, fungi and things of this kind, do no harm at all. They can live quite well without us, we can live quite well without them, um, and we get on very well together. And there are many, many more examples of that. But um, the most difficult thing to define um, is parasitism itself. And this has eluded very many people 
And um, there are um, at one count, I have 60 different um, definitions of parasitism. Um, most of them futile, of course, because every time you try to define parasitism in one way, another way comes up. Um, so I'm going to ignore this one um, and say simply that parasitism is the study of, sorry, uh, parasitology is the study of parasites, and um, the interaction between the host is called parasitism. Now, parasitology has a very distinguished record. Um, there are chairs of parasitology. I actually held one at one stage. There are journals of parasitology. There are books of parasitology. And um, yet we don't quite know um, what they are. So um, a lot of attempts have been made to define. So I'll put them on the floor like uh, Len Wilson does. I never understood why he did that. Um, and um, that parasitism, then, is the name given um, to a situation in which one, the parasite, lives at the expense of the other, the host. Um, these aren't necessarily complete, um, but um, this is a very good um, way of looking at this. Now, now, come back to the parasites. There are lots of them. I've ignored the prokaryotes, the bacteria, and um, the most important parasites are the protozoa, single-celled organisms, the worms, and there are three groups of worms. There are the roundworms, um, the tapeworms, and um, the, sorry, the roundworms, um, the tapeworms, and the flatworms. Um, and I'm very interested in these. Um, and they're also the fungi. And the fungi are quite a fascinating group. Now, they all have their particular adaptations and, um, have, again, have caused a lot of interest in parasitology, mainly from an evolutionary, not mainly from an evolutionary point of view, um, but from the point of view of the diseases they cause um, and also from an evolutionary point of view. Now, I'm going to touch briefly um, on the parasites themselves, and um, simply say, uh, I think we, most of the time we're unaware of parasites, totally unaware of parasites. And um, they're all around us, as I've written in this particular book. Um, most are so small that we never see them, and some of them only are seen or only recognised when they actually cause overt disease um, in ourselves or our animals um, or our crops. Um, some are easy to see, but are so commonplace um, that we ignore them when they come. Um, I'm just imagining a walk through a wood on a summer's day, somewhere in the temperate zone. A mosquito has just bitten one of us. A cat is leisurely scratching to rid itself of fleas. A dog in the long grass has just picked up a tick. A mangy fox, fox wanders miserably past. A mother assiduously combs her child's hair, looking for nits. Looking upwards, we see that some of the leaves in a nearby tree are withering. There's a fungus growing from the trunk, and a massive mil mil a mistletoe clothes the branches. Young cuckoos um, are uh, um, seen in the upper branches there. Um, their parents have laid, egg laid their eggs in the nest um, of another bird, not of their own species, earlier on. Now, we, the child, the cat, the dog, the fox, and the unsuspecting bird, um, are all hosts to parasites. And moving further afield, um, we find a beekeeper bemoaning the fact that his hives have failed. Um, Some a fisherman can't find any fish. And these are all examples um, of um, parasitic diseases affecting a world we live in, this huge world we live in. Now, the examples I've given you are, are mainly um, minor, minor irritations, annoying, um, rather than anything else. But in fact, in much of the world, particularly the developing world, um, parasites are a matter of life and death. And for example, three quarters of a million African children die from malaria every year. Um, there's a vast amount of Africa, the majority of Africa, um, cannot be used for, for cattle um, because of a disease related to sleeping sickness, um, so by tsetse flies throughout um, the whole of this area. So throughout the world, we have these major diseases. The World Health Organization, in 1975, um, drew up a list of the most important diseases, six most important diseases, and um, five of which were parasitic diseases. And I don't think things have changed um, very much. So um, what is important about this is that there are parasites everywhere, and they affect us and our crops, our trees, and everything around us. So um, what I want to do now let me get on to the topic in, in hand um, and talk, um, if I possibly can, um, about the diseases of crops, um, which is why you're here and why um, Chris would have given this particular lecture, crops and trees. Um, and 
There's not a single plant that has not got a number of parasitic infections. Um, and many have many more, and uh, just a few. Um, the most important infections are fungi, um, and I'll talk a bit more about fungi in a moment, um, and nematode worms, little round worms. Now, fungi are very interesting because um, we're all familiar with them. I imagine that all our fridges have got something which has got something infected by fungal growth in it. If not, um, you're, you're cleaner than I am. Um, and um, our garden is full of things. Um, there's mildew on the, on the trees. Um, my apples are rotting at the moment. They didn't ripen quickly enough. Um, and these are all due to fungi. Now, the life cycle of a fungus is very, very simple. Um, basically, it consists of a spore, which is a resistant stage, um, and this spore, when it alights um, on um, a host, um, enters that host and spreads hyphae around it. These are the feeding, not roots, of course, they're simply cells that spread right throughout the organism, um, supping the nutrient from the animal itself, from the animal or plant itself. Um, and in humans, we have candida, for example, and we have a number of other infections. Athlete's foot is another one, example, of a fungal infection. Now, the fungi are not particularly, um, sorry, not particularly um, restricted to, um, uh, uh, to being a parasite. Sorry, um, I said it again. Um, a parasitism is not a natural form of life um, for the fungi. Their natural form of life um, is in the ground, on the soil, somewhere in the air, um, where they do no harm, they just multiply. And we've seen them, I say, we've seen them all, and I mentioned some of these earlier. Um, if they happen to be on the outside of our fruits or our um, trees, um, it doesn't matter. They're not doing any harm at all. So you can just remember that. The cycle is very, very simple. A spore gets into the uh, living organism and then spreads throughout it and draws the nutrient away, and eventually um, it dies. And um, I think the best example that I can give you is, of course, potato, late potato root rot. We've all had that, where you dig up your potatoes, which you're absolutely fine, and you've just got a soggy mass at the end of this. Um, and that's what's happening the whole time um, with the fungal infections. Now, um, no crop is exempt from fungal infections. And every gardener must be familiar with the nuisance they are. And spend, we spend millions of time, millions of pounds every year on fungicides to try to control um, these um, quite natural organisms, which in some cases don't do very much harm at all. Now, um, it's a nuisance. My raspberries weren't very good this year. The blackberries are very good. I don't know what happened there. I said my apples weren't very good. Um, the whole of my um, the vegetables and, and um, trees and uh, fr um, fruit that I grow um, has been badly affected in one way or another, because the environment has been absolutely right for this. Um, it's moist and warm. And we are moist and warm, so why, um, we are, so, so why we are so susceptible to fungal infections, most of which don't do us any harm. And our fungi feed um, by feeding on chitin, um, and of course our nails are full of chitin and our hairs, so that's why we get that. Um, but of course, um, what's important is they get into plants. And um, the number of plants they get into is absolutely immense. I can't find a single plant um, even the eucalyptus, that doesn't have a number of fungal parasites. Now, these cause immense, work, uh, ma immense amount of loss in various ways, and one of Chris's slides was showing me that, and I'll refer to that again in a moment. I paused a moment ago because I realised that Chris had said that in his slide, and I'll come back to that again in a moment. Um, now, the world's most important crops are rice, wheat, maize, potatoes, soybean, uh, and sugar cane. And last then also, uh, not a food crop, but cotton. Now, these crops are of immense value to everybody because, in fact, in some parts of the world, um, the success of these crops is the difference between li life and death. If you're trying to f keep a small farm going in Uganda or Kenya or somewhere like that, um, you cannot possibly afford to let your crop be taken over by these fungi. It's a massive, um, impor massive importance. Now, I'm going to briefly go through some of these. Um, and um, rice, I think, is probably the most important. I've got some figures here. Um, rice originally came from Asia. It's produced mainly in Asia at the moment. Um, and uh, there are 45 separate species of fungi that attack rice. Uh, they attack the roots, they attack the stems, they attack the whole of the rice, and some actually get into the rice grains themselves. So there are lots and lots and lots of fungi um, that are attacking um, our rice. And as I say, in many parts of the world, rice is the staple crop, staple, um, crop and loss of rice can be absolutely tremendous. And I've got some figures here. Um, in um, 
the world as a whole, and that's including New Zealand and China, um, there are 700 me million metric tonnes of rice produced every year. Um, some of that ends up in our plates in the Indian restaurants around here, um, but most of it, in fact, is the staple diet for people living in some of these countries here. Now, um, what is one of the problems with rice is that it grows in water. And water, moist habitat, is just what you need for the fungi to grow, produce their spores, and to spread around. And when they do spread around, it can be absolutely devastating. Um, there are 20 species involved, 20 species of fungi. So they, sorry, um, f uh, I, I said a moment ago, um, I got it right there, yes. Um, lost a moment, I'll come back in with that. Um, it's um, yeah, about 20 fungal diseases caused by 45 different species um, of um, fungus. So they're very, very susceptible. The great problem is trying to bring this under control um, because you can't use fungicides um, because you can't pump fungicides into the water um, where these plants um, are growing. Very, very difficult to control indeed. Um, if you want another example, wheat, um, very good crop. It's grown under all conditions, it's very important to it. And it's um, one of our most important, probably um, the most important um, crop, food crop. And uh, people argue about that, but I think it's quite sensitive. But um, it's particularly important to us in the Northern Hemisphere, in Australia and New Zealand, where we grow very much, sorry, vast amounts of it. Um, in China, for example, um, there's an annual production of um, 700 million tonnes, the sort of figure that I gave you earlier. These huge sums, these huge amounts are actually produced, these metric tonnes here. Um, and um, wheat is affected by over 50 species of fungi. So lots and lots of these fungi are available um, to contaminate wheat. And they attack all parts of the wheat. Um, they attack the roots, the stem, and most important, they actually get into the um, kernels themselves. And sometimes you don't actually see that until the crop has been made. And this is devastating, of course, as you can imagine, um, for the farmers. Um, there's another problem with wheat, because there is um, a fungus um, called caviceps, um, which is damaged to the plant. But it also produces ergot. And of course, if we contaminate ergotoxin, um, dangerous toxin which can kill animals and humans, and um, this is a very serious effect. And it, there are lots and lots of outbreaks of ergotism um, throughout the world simply um, by eating, right, eating wheat that has been affected in this particular way. Um, the um, other loss, of course, um, to um, of wheat is to uh, birds that feed them. And of course, if they feed on the um, ergotoxin infected wheat, um, they die as well. So there's a, a tremendous knock on effect on the habitat as a whole. Now, potato is a major crop worldwide, one of the most important ones. Um, there are 370 million tons produced annually, and they're affected by, but it's affected by over 30 species of um, fungus. And as I said earlier, fungi like, live in the soil, they like in the soil, potatoes are in the soil, um, it's nice and easy for them to get in, and they're very, very serious indeed. And um, the most important fungal infection of potatoes is late blight, um, which can kill um, over 100%, uh, sorry, not over, up to 100% of the crop. And this is the one, of course, which changed the world in the 1840s, um, when the Irish crop um, succumbed to this. Um, so potato, late blight in potatoes, has had a very serious effect um, throughout the world. And um, the fact that the Irish diaspora is much greater than the number of people in Ireland itself at the moment, Irish and Ireland, is due um, to the potato blight. And um, my mother uh, um, was writing um, when she was a, a young girl, leaving Ireland, um, even after the potato blight, was very scared um, that the plate of blight would come back again. And she, like many young women of her age at that time, um, moved out of the country, she went to Canada, um, just to get away from the, the fear, not the blight itself, but the fear of the blight. And I think it's important to say that. It's often the fear of some of these diseases um, that more are more important here. Um, lots of species are um, found in potatoes. I think we've all had them in the gardens and so. Um, and they're very, very difficult to control, extremely difficult to control. Now, soybean is something that we don't think of very much, but it is, in fact, a major crop, an extremely made crop indeed. Um, about 262 metric tonnes of soybean are produced every year, and it's um, susceptible um, to over, 50, uh, over 40 species of fungi. Um, and uh, these take a variety of different forms there. And um, 
One of the problems here is that um, one disease is a sudden, um, called sudden death um, of soybean. And that's absolutely distressing to the farmers um, because the crops look absolutely right, they're absolutely perfect, they've grown up all beautifully, and suddenly they keel over dead. So you wake up one morning and find that your whole crop is gone. Um, so um, this is really absolutely devastating because you've got no time to go back and make any changes that you might want to make. Um, and um, the next um, important is sugarcane. Now sugarcane um, is caused by a number of different species of um, grasses, um, and um, we don't know how many um, different fungi infect this because the fungal taxonomists have had a real go at these. And um, I don't know if you know about taxonomy, there are two kinds. There are the splitters and the lumpers. And the splitters divide everything into as many forms as they possibly can, and the lumpers lump them all together. Um, so um, the net result is um, that the number of fungal species infecting soybean, um, sugarcane, sorry, is either six or thirty. Um, <laughs> Um, depending on which textbook you pick up. Um, so, um, obviously, in evidence, it is very, very important indeed. Um, but I think what is important here is that sugar cane is actually the world's largest crop, something we didn't understand. Um, and in fact, the number of tons, metric tons produced is um, 1.8 billion tons of sugar cane produced every year. It is an absolutely massive crop. And um, again, it could be absolutely devastating. Um, now, the diseases um, include a whole variety of different things affecting um, all parts of the crop, um, from the root, the root um, all through up the stem, and um, all of them are very, very difficult to control. Um, and I won't go into the whole lot of diseases there um, that occur um, in sugar cane. And the last crop is not a crop, really, um, but um, the horticulturalists, sorry, the um, world... Um, agriculturalists regard it as one of the major diseases, and that is cotton. Um, and um, it's unlike the diseases so far because, of course, we don't eat cotton. Um, but um, it is important. To, um, it's, um, it's the most important fibre crop. Um, 26 million metric tons are produced every year, and mainly in the United States. Now, in China, as we know, if we look at the labels inside our, our cotton shirts and sweaters and things, um, very, very susceptible to fungal infections. And there are over 28 species um, that, infect, um, uh, 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 that affect this particular cotton. cotton. And they affect everywhere. Um, they, the root, quite a lot on the root, up to the stem. And of course, in the cotton ball, that's the most important thing in the cotton ball. And we all heard about the cotton ball weevil in the United States. And the fungal infections are much, much more infection than this. Um, and these are um, fungi that, that thrive in conditions of moisture, humidity, which are just right. Um, for the growth of cotton. So um, I just talked about those crops at the moment, how important they are and how important fungal diseases are um, to us um, in the destruction of crops. And it's very, very difficult, as you probably gathered when I talked about the number of species a, a moment ago, um, it's very difficult to estimate the um, value, the economy, the economic cost, because um, no one knows what it is. Um, We've got lots and lots of information. We can tell you what the crop in a particular village in Nigeria is, for example, or a part of China. But in most states, it's very, very difficult to estimate the cost. And I'm going to come on to one of Chris's slides there, so I won't labour this particular point. Um, but um, the FAO, and I do trust the FAO, I trust, I trust the FAO and the WHO and the Centre for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, and apart from that, I don't trust anything from anybody. So mostly I'm very um, conscious of um, that I'm rather pushing the FAO. And I do think they've got some very, very good data, extremely good here. Um, and um, they take together, all together, the five main crop plants, um, crops, of, um, as I mentioned earlier there, um, and uh, the threat there, the total um, tonnage of these um, is 4.7 billion tonnes um, of um, crop, um, the main five major crops there. And it occurred, uh, uh, just a cursory look, um, about 10% of it um, is destroyed um, by fungal infections. That's awful lot, an awful lot of fungal infections. Now, um, it's not easy, I say, um, to estimate what the um, costs are, and um, attempts have been made. Um, for example, um, the, um, a different approach is all to look at not um, the cost, because I'll come into the cost in a moment there, um, and the FAO um, reckon that up to four billion people could be fed for a year 
um, on the crops that are lost um, through to fungi. And I think that's a better way of looking at it. I think, you know, we can pat you around, we've got millions and millions of pounds, well, so what? Um, four billion people, four billion people more could be fed if it wasn't for fungal diseases. And I think it's a very, very important point. So a lot has been done um, to look at this. And we look at the diseases, sorry, the crops. Um, and then near my own area, my own particular field here, um, don't you take into account also the malnutrition which occurs. If the crops fail, and people starve. And that's a very difficult thing. How on earth do you measure that? And I don't think you can uh, measure that easily. So um, I think in the last few minutes, I've given you some idea of the importance of fungal infections um, in crops of various kinds. And they're terribly important of the horticultural um, business in this country and all over the world. Um, the, this is a huge business, I think, as um, Roderick Flood has said in his lectures. Um, gardens are big business, huge big business. And um, fungi are very good business for the um, garden shops, of course, because you buy more and more of the plants and you put them in the soil and they die and they die again. And people don't realise that um, you can't get rid of the fungi from the soil. You've got to be very, very careful not to replant material there. Now, um, there are many fewer fungal infections of trees um, than there are of um, the crop plants I talked earlier there. Um, and um, it's estimated that about 30 important ones, of which 20 are very important. Now, you know, compare that with the numbers I've been giving you before. That's for trees as a whole, not just an individual species of crop or crop species. Um, about 20 or 30. Um, and I think if I was studying fungi, um, I would study the fungi of trees because there won't be so many to remember, but that's um, a bit, little, little, bit, little bit selfish. Um, the, um, now, the attention, of course, um, they attract the attention because of their effects. And people, newspapers write about these. No newspaper writes about the failure of a rice crop in China. People do write a, a lot about the fact that their chestnut tree in the garden um, has suddenly um, died. So an awful lot of attention here. Now, um, the unseen effects of this, um, of disease in, of tr plants, of trees, is very important because the timber industry is an absolutely massive industry. And the timber industry suffers very, very badly um, from these um, trees because you cannot use, um, in most cases, the wood from the trees. Now, the fungal infection work in exactly the same way as they did um, for the crop plants. Um, the fungus gets into the tree, um, and um, unlike the crop plants, mostly get in through the roots. Um, and spread through the roots of the tree, and spread up through the tree, and actually um, block um, the flow of water um, up through the plant. So the tree just withers away, and sometimes you get a growth around the tree, a canker around the tree, um, where the plant has tried to stop um, this, uh, these fungi spreading, and in fact itself has uh, simply strangled itself, which is rather sad here. Um, and there are lots and lots of these. And um, the word dieback has come quite recently, and um, dieback is when an infection starts at the far, far limits of the tree, the shoots and the twigs, moves down the branches to the tree, and it dies back um, from the outside. So um, again, dieback has been very, very important. Um, now, some of the most important trees uh, are beech bark. Um, this affects um, bouch, uh, sorry, as it did, um, um, beech trees all over the world. Um, and um, what's interesting about this one, in fact, is that it's helped by an insect, a scale insect here. Um, and the scale insect climbs up the tree, causes damage, a um, lot of damage, and the spores um, are able to enter through the damaged um, part of the leaf. A very important disease here. Um, and um, um, again, there's a lot going on at the moment because um, this particular fungus can actually block the host's reaction um, to it, like our immune system. Um, so um, the fungus really does get a very, very good grip indeed. Um, chestnut blight, only recognised since 1909, very, very important one here, um, and it spread through um, our forests, our woods, as you know, um, and um, it causes a great loss and a great deal of distress to the people who own this. Um, Dutch elm disease um, is another interesting one, um, and one I think which is very, very important, and people are talking about this one here. Um, and Dutch elm disease has been around for a short time, and it's caused by infection with um, several species of fungi. And again, what's interesting me is that these are spread by the elm bark beetle. And the beetle um, caught draws holes in, in, the, in the plant, various parts of the plant, uh, and um, the tree, and the fungus enters through these. 
Um, and the um, damage you've done, of course, is not just the fungus, but it leaves the tree open to attack by other pathogens as well. So um, Dutch germ disease is, is a complicated, a very, very complicated disease indeed. Um, I've got some figures for this one. Um, it's estimated that since Dutch germ disease occurred in um, Europe in the 19, about less than 100 years ago, um, just over 100 years ago, um, 25 million trees have been killed. And I've tried to find out um, what a chestnut tree, sorry, what um, an elm tree costs. And I can't really kind of find that because the, um, I get the different figures from various people. 25 million is an awful lot. I mean, it's probably about a thousand pounds. Um, and it's, when you think of that, you're working millions of pounds just for this one disease um, in Tim in loss at all. And again, probably the ones come our way most recently is sudden oak death. Um, and it's caused by a number um, of, the, of, of para, uh, sorry, of fungal infections, um, including Photophora, um, which is the fungus that infects potatoes, a different species, um, but it's um, um, a very, very wide, very wide raised fungus and attacks the, um, the sudden oak the tree here. And this was first seen in the United Kingdom um, in just in 202, um, 2002, um, less than 20 years ago. And um, when you look at it around the country now, you can actually see that um, oak has been destroyed all over the country here. But it doesn't just go for oak. Uh, we think that, um, it's found in beech, sweet chestnut, horse chestnut, northern red oak, turkey oak, home oak, garden larch, and herbaceous plants, including her, her, um, rhododendron. That's not a bad thing, but I'm not going to, <laughs> to comment on that particular thing. Um, and very sadly, there is no cure and no treatment for this, as far as we know at the present time. Um, and I go back to this um, Photophora, the genus Photophora. Um, it's, um, it, the genus Photophora itself affects a hundred different species of plants, of, uh, um, many of the most important. Very, very important indeed. Now, a disease that I hadn't come across before um, was um, red band needle blight. Um, and this is found in conifers. Um, and it's characteristic by causing red bands um, on the uh, leaves, the tiny leaves like that, which drop off and a tree with no leaves doesn't thrive very well, and these trees die very seriously here. Very important disease indeed. Um, it occurs mainly in Eurasia, Africa, and Oceania, Oceania and um, it affects over 80 species of plants in you know, a huge host range. We're not used to that in human infections that uh, only affect a very small range of hosts. Um, over 80 species are here. And um, here, the um, um, fungi are quite, sp uh, quite clever, um, because they don't have to enter through a lesion in the tree. They actually get in through the stomata um, of the tree itself. So they um, get sticky and they get ca um, carried into the tree and then carried throughout the tree as a whole. Now, the best known and um, one of the least understood of the trees of uh, fungi um, is the one that causes ash, ash dieback. Um, it's also called Talara. Um, and the infection begins causing wilting, as I say, um, of, the of the proximal parts of the plant, of the peripheral parts of the plant, which spread straight back into the disease at all. And this has been a very, very serious disease indeed. Um, eventually, the whole of the crown is infected, um, hence the name, um, as I said earlier on, um, dieback. And this is spread by windborne um, spores. Um, no way you can deal with windborne spores. So um, these are some of the trees we see, but the most important ones um, are those that affect the roots of the trees. And I said fungi live in the roots, and they spread throughout the soil. And um, the, obviously, the roots of a tree are very, very susceptible. And there are a very large number of infections here. Um, there's one particular species um, called Amillaria, um, which has a huge range um, of hosts, a huge range of hosts, and uh, mainly um, conifers, hardwoods, and herbaceous shrubs. Um, now, basically, um, they just feed at the moment. They're quite cunning. They start feeding on the outside of the tree, of, 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 the, of the root, it causes no harm, and then suddenly they start getting inside and spreading throughout the tree. Um, so most of the time, they're not doing any harm, um, but they're just waiting there to take this opportunity of penetrating the root. And after that, um, what happens is that the fungus spreads out through the, z through the tree, um, and it decays from the inside. It becomes very sponge-like from the inside, um, and very much like um, dry rot, um, as we, we see in our houses from, from uh, time to time. 
And they're known as a whole series of different names, and you'd have seen them, actually. And because the most important part is when the plant comes above the soil and forms a mushroom um, around the base of the tree. And we've all seen these, and they've got a variety of different names. They're called the oak fungus or the honey mushrooms. And um, these um, now spread um, the spores widespread through the air, up to the soil, mainly through the soil. And they spread a very, very long way indeed. Um, and, um, but the most important mechanism, sorry, an unimportant mechanism, or less important mechanism is the spread, um, is simply um, that a fungus can spread over a vast area. Now, um, the smallest parasite I know is about the size of a red blood cell, half the size of a red blood cell. The largest one I know is um, caused by amoraria, and um, the largest one covers over 100 acres. A single plant, a single fungus, has spread from tree to tree, and it's just one entity um, affecting some um, about 100, um, 100 he sorry, acres, hectares um, of soil. So um, it's attracted a lot of attention. And um, I've advocated somewhere else that this is an ideal uh, fungus for school children to study, because you can see it on the ground, you can see, look around, you can look and see what's happened to the tree, and um, I hope that's taken up there. Um, now, um, again, figures. I, um, it's been reckoned here that in the United Kingdom alone, um, just two diseases, red band needle blight and note death, um, costs nine billion pounds um, each year. That's these diseases. And, you know, um, they can take me away my bus pass um, <laughs> to save a few hundred pounds. <laughs> and yet it's fungi. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, these fungi are causing much, much more damage than that. Um, and as well, I just uh, it had a vast impact on the timber industry, of course, um, but also on um, the scenery, the landscape as a whole. And um, great cities, um, that's Edinburgh, um, Amsterdam, London, have lost many of the cities, big trees that used to line the boulevards. Um, they're gone forever. Edinburgh has changed completely. Amsterdam has changed completely. And I think you needn't go further than Salisbury and have a look at John Constable's painting um, of Salisbury Cathedral. All the trees in the front of that have gone now. So um, these fungal diseases are very, very important indeed. Now, um, what to do about it? Well, fungicides are there, but fungicides are expensive, very expensive, and they're environmentally unfriendly. Um, one of the ways around this one is actually to breed um, plants um, that are resistant um, to these fung fungi. Um, we've all enjoyed Jersey royal potatoes. Um, Jersey royal potatoes are, in fact, resistant to um, late blight. Um, and it happened, a single mutation, a um, long time ago, uh, in the 1900s, um, gave these um, potatoes a chance to survive. Now, um, it takes a very long time to breed a, a tree, for example, breed a, a tree or a large plant. And there's a much easier way to do it and that is by genetic engineering. And it's so easy to do, to breed these plants um, that are genetically resistant to, for example, drought um, with increased um, productivity of in, in terms of increased crop, better growth of trees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but we don't like genetic engineered things at all. Um, so we're very scared about that. And there's very, very little um, effort going into breeding um, genetically engineered um, crops of this kind um, because of the international dislike um, of genetically engineered material. 